Margaret Thompson. Alan Thompson is also an owner. And the name of the farm is Windrush. We're in the southern Gulf Islands, which is at the western end of Canada. We have 9.4 acres. It's a mixture of pasture and woodland. It's quite close to the sea. There's a road that runs right in front of us, and we own a few square yards on the other side of the road, which is no use to us, whatever. And it's very suitable land for what we want to do, which is raise turkeys and sheep. Uh, the heritage breed of sheep is the Cotswold. It's a very ancient British breed. It was one of the first breeds that was brought to Canada 100 or 150 years ago. It's no longer popular, and the reason for that is that other breeds grow faster. So people who want to grow meat would choose something else. But this breed was chosen by us because of its wool. The wool is wonderful. It grows, they grow a huge amount of wool. It's really lustrous. It grows nearly an inch a month. So we shear them twice a year. And it's very much in demand by spinners. Now you mentioned that the wool is popular with spinners. Could you explain why this particular area and this island works really nicely for that thing? Well, this is an island that doesn't have a great deal of pasture. A lot of it's hilly. It's very suitable for sheep. We have enough rain that we have grass in most places year round. In a normal year, we have plenty of grass. So it's very suitable for sheep. And there are many things you couldn't do on this land. You can't grow vegetables everywhere. So this makes good use of the land. And the sheep are happy also in woodland gives them shelter. You don't need to provide much in the way of protection for them in the winter. As long as they can go under trees, they really need the minimum of shelter provided by their owners. And they're very independent and hardy and very placid. And for beginners like we were, that's a very important feature. So if you have a sheep that you shear every six months, and yet not too much weather, is that good? Because you're sort of taking away her protection for a good chunk of the year, correct? They don't need nine inches of wool for protection. An inch or two is enough at the beginning of winter. By about January, they would have three inches because we shear them in March and September. March never coincides with the birth of the lambs because we always breed late. We would have lambs in April or May. This year it may be June. And in September they have plenty of time to grow more wool before it gets cold. So um, how did you learn about heritage breeds? Oh, sort of by chance really. Um, getting interested in sheep because when I was off work with an injury and I needed a project, one of my fellow workers gave me a lamb that was sick and needed a lot of looking after. So this lamb eventually, after much expense and many visits to the vet, did survive and grew up to be fairly normal. And we thought this lamb should have a companion. So we bought a Border Leicester ewe and they got along well. And then we thought, well, if our little lamb is going to learn everything about how to grow up to be a normal sheep, she should see lambs being born. You know, she should see the whole life cycle of sheep. So we got the older one bred and we had twins. And that hide is from one of those twins, which didn't live very long. It was born with an abnormality, and we only were able to keep it alive for six weeks. So that was your first foray? That was our first contact with sheep, yes. But we got interested in wool because the Border Leicester is a wool breed, and she had the most beautiful wool. And the other lamb that did survive had the most outstanding wool. It was really wonderful. So we thought we should get involved in wool production. 
So we looked at various breeds and I was getting interested in spinning then. So I bought a spinning wheel and the lady who sold me the spinning wheel had recently been to England and she had bought some wool there. So she brought out her stash of wool, showed me this pillowcase that had Cotswold wool in it. And I put my hand in and I'll never forget the sensation of touching this very silky wool. It was long staple, each fiber was quite long, and it felt just so silky and soft and beautiful. And I thought, right then, I want to grow this. And so we then looked around, and eventually we found some Cotswold lambs, but they were a long way away. We had to go to the interior of BC to get them. And they were our first Cotswold sheep but they were not registered. They were wonderful sheep, but they weren't registered. And by that time, we were getting interested in preserving breeds, you know, heritage breeds. And so we looked around for registered animals. And for that, we had to go to Ontario. So we had two little lambs, one of them that produced this, that came out all the way from Ontario and we had to go and pick them up in Alberta. And that was the beginning of our flock. One of those sheep was the mother of the oldest sheep that was sheared today, the mother of Jasmine. Jasmine's mother was black, Jasmine is white. Then why is that unusual? I don't know if it's unusual because I don't know how colors are passed on in Cotswold sheep. I presume because black sheep are so rare that that's a recessive characteristic, but no one has ever been able to tell me exactly how the colors are passed on. And I think that's because they're so rare. Nobody has a big enough flock to do any real study. I had read somewhere that black was not allowed in, any, in, in the Cotswold registry, and so that's why they stopped doing it. But if you have a wool that says, lustrous is that and it's permanently dyed black. I would think that's a huge advantage. Yes, I can sell black more easily than I can sell white. Because of the luster and the... The, the luster is the same. If you shear every six months and the sheep doesn't have lice or anything that makes it want to rub that would cause it uh, to felt the wool, then it's perfectly good. In your experience, do you think that heritage breeds are have similar husbandry requirements to industrial breeds or no? No, they don't. They're much hardier. Uh, they need a different diet. They have very much longer lives. And they very often have fewer problems with, um, well, with lambing for sheep and uh, fertility in general is very, very good. Uh, I would say that your Cotswolds might be a good example of an animal that produces well on a, on a less structured regimen. Is that correct? Yes. It also is uh, very successful with minimal expensive food. It can do well on grass. It could survive quite well on grass alone. It might not reach its mature size quite as quickly. We give a small amount of grain, a very small amount of grain every day, because that's a way of keeping the sheep responding to us when we call them. All we have to do is shake grain, you know, make a rattling sound, and they will come running. And the sound of the gate, the chain on the gate, is what really works to make them come. They can be in the top field, nearly half a mile away, I just rattle the chain really loudly and they will come down the hill at full speed. So this, this, this concept of behavior with the animal is also something that heritage breeds are known for, correct? You breed specific yes, but, breeds? but we've, we understand it much better now than we did when we started. When we wanted to bring one sheep up here for some sort of procedure, we used to separate the one sheep down in the field at the bottom, put a collar on it, put a rope on it, and make it walk up the hill. Well, that's difficult. Sheep are animals that like to be in groups. What we would do now is bring the whole bunch up, 
shut the gate, and then separate the one we want, and then take the other four back. We only have five. So uh, we understand sheep behavior much better, and everything we do now is a lot less effort than it used to be. When you make your, your decisions about breeding, the sheep, would you tell me about the behavior that you want in this specific breed of sheep? Well, we want them to be as placid as this group that we have now. They don't panic easily. You know, they're a little bit cautious when they meet strangers, but uh, you hardly ever see them run away from anything. They'll stand back and they'll stare at it. You know, they're full of curiosity. So we like that. We want them to be, you know, reasonably friendly without being pets. And we want them to live a long time and let us do the things we need to do to keep them healthy. We give them shots occasionally. They get um, immunizations when they're young, and then they have a booster shot. And the youths get one shot during their pregnancy, about three weeks before they lamb. And they don't mind that at all. We have one person talk to the sheep while the other one gives the shot. And they really don't feel it. You can keep their minds on the conversation with Alan while I stick the needle in. They definitely seem to be a more docile type animal, which makes them easy to manage. Yes, it's very, I'm glad we chose that breed. But we didn't know about all the good qualities. We chose them because of their wool. And now we find that there are more customers than we'll ever satisfy who would like to eat the meat. And it's also very easy here to sell meat to the local grocery store because they want three animals a week, and they do all the cutting. It, the easiest way for us to dispose of meat, it may not be the most profitable, but the easiest way is for us to take three sheep to the abattoir, pick them up the next day in our car, take them to the grocery store, and a week later we get a check in the mail. Now, if we deal with individual customers, we have to find out what cuts of meat they like. And very often they haven't got the faintest clue. That's why our local abattoir, which is very important here for farmers, has information on the website about what a standard cut is, which is a quick, easy way to make an animal into meat. There's no boning. That's one of the things that takes time. There's no grinding. It doesn't take that much time to grind the meat, but it takes ages to clean up the machine. So if most people would just have a standard cut, they would find their job much easier. But they'll do anything else you ask if you pay them for it. So if you want everything boned or everything ground, it can be done. But finding out what the customer wants can be really time consuming. And it can take several conversations they have to look at the website. They have to tell me what their family likes to eat. And then I have to tell them how to get the most of what they like to eat. So I've had to learn all about cutting meat. Which are the tender cuts? Which are the ones that are good when they're cooked for half a day? And which parts of the animal are best ground? Now this is something we spoke about earlier that well, for instance, England is known for many things, but two of them are good English wool and then good English mutton. Mm. So mutton has been something that has kind of gone the way of all things, culturally speaking. Can you tell me about your experience with mutton? Do you like the taste of it? And Yes, we like the taste of it. Now, I don't eat very much meat because it gives me joint pains. But I do always have a little taste of mutton. And we've had animals, I think, about as old as six. We've had most of the animal ground, but we always keep the legs and the shoulders. You know, that's the carvable parts. Everything else, we would have ground. Interesting. So it, there's a resurgence of mutton in England. 
I understand. I don't know. I, I read about that, that they're starting to be familiar with other cuts. And again, some of this is because of the slow food movement. Yes. And the, the cultural understanding of foods and the joy in, in an actual food, not just nutrients to mm. get into the body. So what does it take for an animal to be considered mutton? Well, uh, it, it's a lamb up to six months. The term they use for slightly older ones in England is hogget, but that's not a well-known term here. And anything older than that is technically mutton. But the difference between an animal that's a year old and 18 months or two years is really not very much. It's just, from my point of view, it's a sort of slightly better lamb. Really old animals we have never sold to anybody else. And we have an excellent way of donating really old animals. We have a fall fair, and the abattoir always raises money by selling burgers. Now, lamb burgers would be tasteless. What they really want is you burgers, you know, older animals, because they're big and they're tasty. And so that's what goes into the lamb burgers. So we have older animals that sometimes we've donated for that. So I would like to also ask you, what, what kind of challenges do you face when you ra raise these breeds in this region? Or are they similar enough to their countries of origin that you think they fit beautifully? I think these fit beautifully. But the challenges are finding customers and it's important to keep in touch with the customers that are happy so that they keep coming back and we're quite successful at that. The main challenges really are controlling predators and finding other people who will breed them because we, we recognize that we can't go on doing this indefinitely. If we have a heritage breed, part of our duty is to find other people who will keep it going.